ながら関係ねえ<笑> Shall we begin? Into his coming I can do this all day Tear down this wall いくぞ Ladies and gentlemen, our guest is born in Planeta and bred in Las Vegas. The best in the world at what he does. One of the toughest SOBs in biz and undisputed cutman, Jacob freaking Duran, aka Stitch. Stitch, are you ready to go genuine, uncensored and unscripted with us today? All right, thanks for having me on. Yeah, I'm going to change my name to freaking Duran now. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like it better than Stitch. Uh, thanks for having me on, guys, and uh, yeah, look forward to it. You know, just uh, just barbershop talk. You know, I'll go by the gyms all the time here in Las Vegas, and I'll go to the Mayweather's gym and City mm -hmm. Box and then Bones Adams gym, and we just go shoot the shit. You know? Yeah, it's just like barbershop, right? You were the barbershop. Yep. So. Yeah, I saw some uh, yeah. videos from Mayweather's. They are great. So yeah, Stitch, you're one of the most recognizable figures in MMA and boxing, especially outside of the fighters and. Uh, you established yourself in the business, but what does it take to be a cat, catman in combat sports, uh, surrounded by all that fighters? Is there more to stitch than meets the eye? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. And, you know, Peter, people ask me all the time, everybody wants to be a catman. They see what I do. Paramedics, nurses, doctors, housewives, guys like you. They, I get messages all the time. And <clears throat> what I tell them is, <clears throat> for the most part, you got to spend hours and days and weeks and months and years in the gym working with these guys, being part of them, understanding the mental part of it as well as the physical part of it, right? And the mental is probably more important, uh, but learn your technique and, and, and you have the confidence in me to work your corner, to wrap your hands, to uh, work your cuts. Uh, it's, it's a timely process and you know, it hasn't been like this all the time. <laughs> so I'm glad to be in the position that I'm at. So when, when you are the, near that ring, you know, with the fighters, what do you look for? Faces, hands, you know? Uh, yeah, good question, man. Uh, yeah, I look for everything. You know, uh, as you always say, I always look at the fighters in the eyes, just like I'm looking at you guys, right? Because the eyes will tell you everything when you know... Uh, what these guys are going through, right? And, you know, like Frank Mir said one time, he says, when I see Stitch walking into the dressing room, my stomach drops because, <laughs> because he says, I know it's time to fight, right? Yeah. So, so I understand these guys, that positioning. And, and uh, you know, I, I always say that fighters are modern day gladiators, yeah. but deep inside, they're all babies. And my job is to take care of the baby. And, and these guys know that, you know, uh, the Klitschko's, the Tyson Furies, all these big giants give me a kiss and tell me they love me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> there has to be a reason for that, right? So yeah, for sure. I, I think I bring that to the table for these guys. And, you know, the bottom line for me, guys, is, <clears throat> is, is to protect the fighters. You know, give them that one more round, give them that opportunity to go home. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's a hurt business. So my job is to make sure that they don't go home hurt. Yeah, you probably save uh, not just rounds, maybe careers for some guys you work with. And did I uh, do my research uh, good? Because I think you also have some uh, background in boxing and kickboxing. Is that right? Yeah, it's a, it's a crazy life. <clears throat> Actually, you guys aren't even bored. You know, so I have a great <laughs> history in my career, right? Growing up, we all have a... A destiny we all came from somewhere right so i i came i was born in i'm mexican by nationality yeah uh, but i was born in the united states and uh but we were farm workers so we were the guys that picked the tomatoes the peaches the cotton the cherries the apricots the walnuts the, it was that, tough that's what, I, that's what i did all my life right so we grew up in very humble beginnings and but american baseball was the sport that i wanted to achieve it so I walked on to a college and, and I didn't have a car, so I would have to kind of hitchhike back home. And, and I didn't know about grants and scholarships. Uh, so I joined the military in 1972 in the Air Force, United States Air Force. And in, I always told myself that if I went to the Orient, I'd like to study the martial arts. That was during the Bruce Lee era, right? So Yeah, the martial arts were getting big then, right? 
they were they were very big then. Yeah, exactly. Bruce Lee. You know, Bruce Lee was the man. So uh, in 1974, they stationed me in a place called Thailand. I, I didn't even know what Thailand was. You know, I was doing <laughs> food, right? and uh, but I had friends that were there like three months before me that were in the stateside with me in same base, and they got there before me, but they already acclimated. So they invited me downtown to see some uh, Muay Thai fights. I didn't know what Muay Thai was, right? And the guy throws a kick and hits a guy here and knocks him out. Crazy, crazy martial art. I said, I'm in, you know? So on, on the base for the GIs, the, the, the soldiers, they had Taekwondo, all right? Well, Taekwondo, Thailand, to me, same shit. What did I know? <laughs> I was a young kid, right? But I, I didn't know that it was a Korean sport. Well, the Koreans left. And the Thais took over the program for the for the GIs on base, but they had to keep the Taekwondo name because that was the agreement, right? But they transitioned us into a lot of the Muay Thai system, and which was great because you learn power kicks with Taekwondo, you know, high kicks, side kicks, different kicks that Muay Thai didn't have, and they incorporated all that into uh, the Muay Thai system. And uh, I got back to the states, and I, you know, kickboxing was brand new in the States. Yeah, I mean, you guys weren't even born, right? So, yeah. yeah. So when I got back, they had karate tournaments, you know, where it's points, bam, bam. Man. Yeah. So I joined two of them, right? And I won them both. And and one guy says, you kick too hard. I was <laughs> to the points, right? Uh, but that's how I got started and got into boxing. And and from there, I opened up my own school of kickboxing. It was ASK, the American School of Kickboxing. And Javier Mendez that trains Habib and Cain mm -hmm. Velasquez. And, well, he was one of the fighters I worked with. When he for real? Yeah, yeah. Scott Coker. Uh, my fighters used to fight for Scott Coker before he was Strike Force and Bellator. And, uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I got a real long history of, of uh, American kickboxing. Uh, no, you, 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 just the names you mentioned now, uh, that's, that's the MMA today. That's the, the, that's the top of the echelon right now, to be honest. Uh, so, that's pretty amazing, too. I didn't know that. That's pretty amazing. Uh, let me ask you this, uh, uh, boxing, uh, once upon a time, perhaps the, the most popular sport on earth, you know, even here in former Yugoslavia, it was very big. Uh, but today, uh, boxing, uh, w uh, just me as a fan, I, I think it sort of declined and declined because it got, uh, I believe, too complicated, too political, in my opinion. Do you see that? Is that the situation in boxing? Because I get the feeling right now that uh, MMA edges out uh, e e in the competition because the best fight the best and you don't have to five years to make the fight. You know, like uh, Tyson Fury wanted to fight Joshua and always some uh, shit came up. You know, e e is that the, the feeling you get from boxing? E is it going to stay that way or e is it going to get better? What do you think? Uh, you got to do your homework pretty good, man. Yeah, let me answer it this way, right? <clears throat> Kickboxing was very big at one time. Very big, yeah. right? Huge. It, it went, it, in Europe, it was very big. And in the United States, it was big, but then it dwindled down. Same thing in Europe. You know, it's not as big as it used to be. Yes. Yeah. MMA, when, when I first started with MMA, the UFC, I didn't know nothing about MMA. And people were talking bad about it and all that, but it became a fan favorite because yeah. of the action. Well, now I'm doing the bare knuckle fights also, which is a different category of fight that's elevating. People want to see excitement. Yes. Right? But getting back into boxing, now boxing is doing fine. You know, and it, it has its own category. But now that they have the social media guys, the Jake Pauls, the KSIs, Logan Pauls, now they have them in the mix for the social media on a platform for marketing. It's a very good idea. But no, I do a lot of boxing. I'm, in fact, I'm doing only boxing right now uh, with top rank, the uh, top promoter uh, in boxing, right? So when the COVID kicked in, they brought me and the other cut man, Mike Basil, to do 32 shows in the bubble at the MGM. So we were there locked in. It was, it was like prison. It was a nice way to do boxing in prison, right? It's just yeah. the fighters, <laughs> the, the, the coaches, the officials, the, the ESPN people. We were on the 12th floor and we couldn't go anywhere. So we were on complete lockdown. Uh, but it was an experience. And yeah. uh, to work with no audience and to work with fighters, I hadn't worked again. But it was the same program that I helped put together in the UFC where they bring in professional cut men because these guys aren't capable of doing top-level work. 
So they did the same program. But I put that, and I'll tell you about this program down the road where me and Bert Watson put that program together. That's universal. Now, and we'll talk about that. But yeah, so uh, when the COVID opened up more, top rank uh, called me and Mike Basil and asked if we would be willing <clears throat> to continue working with them. And uh, the, the pay is very good. It's boxing. Uh, you know, I got uh, June the 11th, June the 18th, June the 25th. I just finished a bunch of work. I just finished a Creed movie. Uh, so I couldn't do other fights in that period. So, yeah, but boxing's okay. It, it has its own category of, of fans. You know, MMA has their own fans that also watch bare knuckle fights, you know. But, you know, so, yeah, it, they're doing fine. It's a good question, though. You know, mentioned just a lot of things. Uh, bare knuckle fighting, uh, boxing, bubble, everything. Uh, KSI, Logan. So now on the bare knuckle side, uh, have you maybe uh, heard for this uh, thing that Ken Shamrock is doing with bare knuckle, Valor? Have you maybe been approached by him? Uh, no, I haven't heard actually. You know, uh, <clears throat> well, let me let me make this check. When uh, Dave Feldman started the bare knuckle fights, Yeah. He called me to be a participant, right? To, to be one of the, the cut men. And I said, yeah, of course, you know, it's it's. I like blood, I like cuts. They're going to have a shitload of them there, right? Yeah, uh, definitely there, definitely yeah. there. So so when the COVID kicked in, I didn't want to fly, but we couldn't, we couldn't travel. So we lost all these opportunities. But when they started again, all the fights were in Florida and that was still a high COVID area. And I didn't want to do traveling, so I put it on hold. And then... Uh, Top Rank came with this offer, so I've been doing this. And then the movie came, and I was doing that. So I haven't had a – but I talked to Dave Feldman when KSI fought uh, uh, Logan Paul. And he said, no, no, we'll get you back. We'll get you back. So it's just a matter of me sorting out. Not a bad problem to have of what's going to be one, two, and three. Mentioning KSI, that was – that match with Logan Paul basically started this celebrity boxing thing. So what do you think about that as well? Because, you know, uh, uh, fewer and fewer people were, were talking about boxing uh, lately. And then that match came and everybody, uh, internet broke, you know, with that match. It wasn't a quality match, let's be honest. But what do you think this celebrity boxing, Jake, Logan, KSI, everyone, uh, do you think it's re renovating the boxing on some way? Nah, I've done like four of them. You know, and, uh, but let me go with KSI and Logan Paul, right? So I get a call that KSI is going to train in Las Vegas, you know, the boxing capital of the world, and they want to know if I'd be a cut man. I didn't know who KSI was, but it's a job <laughs> opportunity, right? I, I love your honesty. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know who Logan Paul was, you know, but find out you that... You didn't know who we were. <laughs> no, I didn't know you guys were young guys. It's a, the new generation, right? I no. just didn't know. But KSI trained in Vegas for six weeks. And every day, like I did Michael B. Jordan in the movie, every day I wrapped his hands in preparation for him doing his work. And, and I, like a, like a fighter, I, tr I told him, here, you're not a rapper. I don't really know what he does. I think he's a rapper. I said, but here, you're a fighter. And I'm going to treat you like a fighter. Allegedly uh, and, uh, a rapper. Allegedly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, see, that's, <laughs> but but he, he probably worked, worked a little bit more than you and I and Peter put yeah. together. No, no, kudos to him. But, you yeah, know. Yeah. So, I'm so not was, a, a fan of his rapping, so to speak. Yeah, I've never heard it, so I don't care, you know. Yeah. But it's a, it's a thing of social media. Yeah. Right? Where, see, I understand marketing. Marketing is one of the things that got me to the point where I'm at. They are doing it good. No, Very good. Yeah, to work with, so I understand. But so when I get the call to work with KSI for, for six weeks, I'm working with them. And finally, about the fourth or fifth week, I said, you know what? I'm going to bless you as a fighter, man, because you did everything that a fighter needs to do to prepare for a fight, not even being, he was an athlete, just like Jake Paul and Logan Paul. Yeah. They're athletes. So yeah. you could mold them a little, a little bit easier. Uh, but I didn't know he had 20 million followers. I didn't know Jake Paul had 20 million followers. Uh, this shit was blowing my mind. And then Vidal Riley got his one millionth follower as we were training, right? Yeah. But we get to, they fly us from Las Vegas to Los Angeles, 40 minute flight in a private jet, right? Mm -hmm. So we go, we land, they take us to a hotel in Beverly Hills. It's like a block away from Rodeo Drive. And I get That's into my room. That's a treatment. I, well, listen, I get into my room and my pillowcases have my initials embroidered, right? And I'm Pretty thinking, cool. Wow. You know, 
So, but when I get into the arena for the fights, people didn't know who I was. They were all, <laughs> they knew the guys from social media. Mm -hmm. So I knew I was in a different world. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but getting back to the popularity, is it good for that? For someone like The Zone, that they work by prescription or subscription, subscription, if they could get a half of a percent of these guys' fans to watch the Logan Paul KSI fight, they made a bunch of money and they did. You know, my Instagram went up just being part of that. So I understand the social media part, you know, and uh, and I applaud it. I have no problems with that. You know, Mike Tyson fighting Roy Jones, and you're gonna see more of it, you know. And yeah. will they come and be part of it? I hope so. You know, for me it's fun. You know, it's 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 just a it's a different experience in in, in my career of what I've been doing. Yeah, listen, uh, well, based on what I asked you earlier, like, uh, and I hear what you're saying, like, uh, that is here to stay. And I think uh, I personally wouldn't buy the pay-per-view for Logan Paul, but, you know, that's just me. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, it, uh, kudos to them, because I think uh, it, that's my problem, like I mentioned with boxing. If I need to get uh, Tank Davis and I get all, I'm a huge fan of, for example, Tank Davis, but if I need to get him, uh, five years to make the fight with uh, Garcia, then it's like, you know, kind of, I, I, I get why the people would uh, go over to this side, you know, because this side gets the shit done, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so I, I respect that, you know. Yeah, no, I understand. You know, like for me, it's just, my job's a lot different than everybody else's. I yeah. show up for the fight, I do the fight, I'm done. And then I go on to my next project, right? You know, so uh, guys that say, hey, who do you think is going to win? Who do you think? I don't know and I don't care, you know, if, if you, because in all fairness, I don't like giving predictions because that's all they are is predictions. You don't know, I don't know, and I'm not going to put my neck out in the line and say, oh yeah, well, Stitch says, I bet 500 bucks on on, on uh, Roly Romero because Stitch said he was going to knock out Javante Davis. Yeah. I don't do that. But Javante <laughs> really nailed him. <laughs> so, you know, but, but I knew a, a friend called me and asked me what I thought. I'll give you my opinion. I, I've known Roly since he was a young kid here in Las Vegas. His father, oh, for real? They came, they came from Cuba, and his father used to smoke cigarettes, walk to the gym, spar with these guys, and and put these guys out. So he was very, very heavy-handed. And Roly became a fighter, but uh, he doesn't understand the marketing aspect of it. Yeah, he, opened, he he don't he don't and he don't listen. So I, you know, I, I mean, we hug each other, we kiss every day. His father's friends with me. Uh, but and I try to teach him, but goes in through here and out through there, and I said, "Well, so uh, when when it comes to training, you know, his whole mentality is knock somebody out." Yeah, and that's fine and dandy, but nobody has a hundred percent knockout ratio. I work on numbers, right? And I knew that his style of fighting, somebody that had good boxing skills would knock him out, and mm. that's exactly what happened. That's what so, happened, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, the 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 only thing, well, in this one, the only thing that counts in boxing is the truth. You know, the combat sports, because you can't bullshit these guys. And you could try to stroke them, but the only thing that counts is the truth, man. Yeah. And uh, you spoke about that university you started, uh, that school uh, earlier. So I'm going to be honest, that wasn't a part of my research. I'm hearing for that just now. So what's that? Yeah. Oh, my school of kickboxing? Yeah. Yeah. So I... When I, when I got back to the States, I lived in Oakland, California, and I got into boxing. I learned to improve my hands, the elbows, the knees. The Muay Thai style was was solid, yeah. you know, and I just wanted to incorporate better hands. <clears throat> so I started working with amateur fighters, boxers, and, uh, you know, and then from there I moved to the suburbs, and uh, I opened up a school of kickboxing with just my credit card. And mm -hmm. uh, people had already known me as a trainer. So I had from kids all the way up to adults. And uh, it was called uh, ASK, the American School of Kickboxing. And uh, yeah, it became quite popular, you know, for uh, uh, people that would train or guys would come. And this is before, well, I would train the local people for sure, boxing and kickboxing, but guys would come from out of town for me to train them. And uh, so that, you know, that's what I did for a long time. I promoted fights and, you know, I'll tell you, I had some, great experiences you know with kickboxing and it got me to the level that's how i learned to be a cut man mm -hmm. is I, I progressed from being a trainer a manager a promoter i learned how to wrap hands i learned how to work cuts and 
And I'll tell you a story. When I was learning to be a cut man, it was boxing only, right? Mm. So I, I'm, I'm trying to learn. And in those days, they wouldn't teach you. But I went to these fights. And this guy did a good job working on the cut. So I said, hey, man, you know, uh, I'm trying to learn to be a cut man. Can you tell me what you did? He says, fuck you. He goes, I'm taking this to my grave. And you got to learn like this. And you walk away. Yeah. I, I, I felt about this big. But I said, I'm never going I'm never, I'm never to be like that, man. I'm always going to teach, you know, because it's not fair to the fighter for you to work with them and you don't know what you're doing, right? So uh, now I go back home uh, with Andre Ward. Uh, you know, he's a undefeated, you know, middleweight champ. And, yep. and now he forgot about it. And I've told this story many times. And I know the guy, but I've never mentioned his name. So now I go back home to a big, big fight with Andre Ward. Now him and his son want to take a picture with me. I said, all right. Yeah. Take a picture. I'm satisfied. You know, oh, I yeah. won. You know, I won. He don't know how, how he just reinforced that I don't want to be like him. I want to be like me. So mm, That's nice. Uh, listen, you, you mentioned you've been around some of the greats of the boxing. And lately, obviously, one of the biggest names in the business in the world is Tyson Fury. Uh, Tyson unfortunately retired. I think that's unfortunate for all the boxing world. Do you think he will step in again? Do you, do, do, do you think that's a possibility? Because I, I have a feeling that he, uh, he doesn't need to prove anything, but I would just love to see him uh, get some more job done, if you know what I mean. Do you think that, that will happen for Tyson? Yeah, of course, 100%. <laughs> you know, you just have to understand the heart and soul of a fighter. And <clears throat> give Tyson Fury credit, bro. He, he He's phenomenal and just natural what he does. But right now, he's training with Nate Diaz in the grappling, right? Talking about him and Francis and Guno, right? And yeah. uh, <clears throat> I don't know if that's going to happen. Uh, but will he have another fight? Yeah, I would say the chances are good. And hypothetically speaking, you know, because... You, you were the captain to both Fury and uh, to Vladimir. But before I ask, ask, ask you that, you weren't in the last match. It was, uh, you were supposed to be. So what's the reason? Uh, because of the COVID or something? Well, no, it was, uh, I was doing the movie. Oh, all right? because and, of and that was, that was kind of like the start of the movie. But then Tyson, you know, talking to his matches, no, we're, we're going to use a guy that, yeah. that we've used over here. I said, that's great. No problems. It works out fine. I got to do because they didn't want me to travel the, for the movie because of the COVID, right? Yeah. We had a test every day. And, and as a matter of fact, I gave up uh, uh, the shows in Dubai where Mayweather fought, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Anderson Silva That's fought. recent, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, get, I, I couldn't go to that because I was filming. And then last week, I had a, another show in Las Vegas here. <clears throat> couldn't go to that because I was filming. So I, I sacrificed a lot of the, like, five fights uh, to do the movie. But... Not a bad price to pay, man. I'll do it any time. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to ask you this previously. Uh, hypothetically speaking, even for exhibition match, if Tyson versus Vladimir would happen again, uh, whose corner would you choose? Yeah, you know, that's, that's a good question. And, and, you know, people ask me, media asked me when I was working with Tyson Fury, what Vladimir would think, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and I said, no, nah, you know what? Vladimir is such a classy man that he knows my job is to take care of fighters, yeah. you know, and, and he knows that he's my number one. Right. And I'll <laughs> tell you stories about I'll tell you stories about Vladimir will blow your mind. Right. Uh, but he knows I'm there to take care of, of fighters. That's my job. That's my my job. But there's a certain bond that I've created with Vladimir and Vitaly, you know, because I was with him for so many, so many, so many years that, uh, you know, when we get deep into the conversation with him, whatever you want, uh, I'll, I'll share some details. Uh, okay. But Tyson Fury's, yeah, so getting back to that question, I would go with Vladimir uh, because of the respect factor. You know, yeah. that was it. If, it. if I had a choice of one or the other, yeah, of course, it'd be Vladimir. No doubt about it. And wishing Vladimir all the good luck all out there on the battlefield. Now, that that just stuff. That's the real battle down there. Uh, you know, it, it, it breaks my heart uh, every time I... <clears throat> I, I see Vladimir because he's kind of like the face for Ukraine and speaking up uh, does a lot of, you know, uh, mentions and all that. Uh, and it breaks my heart, you know, uh, <clears throat> but 
there was a lot of great moments that I had with Vladimir and Vitaly, right? And and I'll tell you, uh, well, let me see here. I'm gonna let you listen to this first, all right? So in in the movie, and you guys are the first ones to kind of pick up on this, right? Because I know yeah. you guys have a good show, and I'm gonna show you some stuff. So in the movie for Creed, yeah. they were using me not only as an actor but as a consultant because I told Michael B. Jordan, I want this stuff to be official. You're representing my sport. And, yeah. and they were open to that. So in one of the fights, they give away the WBC belt, which is the green championship belt, right? So they asked me who should give the belt away. And I said, well, let me give you the history. The WBC belt was created by Jose Suleiman from Mexico City. He's the president of the WBC. See, so it should be given away by a Mexican fighter or a person. So in the audience, as the extra, there was one guy that was about my age, a tie and all that. So I chose him to give the belt away. So going fast forward, I was doing a show in Dallas, boxing show, and Mauricio Suleiman, the father, uh, the, the son is there because the father passed away. So I'm telling him the story of how we represented the WBC at its highest point. And then we start talking about Vladimir and Vitaly. And he says, let's take a picture and let's send it to them. So I don't know if you can see this, right? Uh, let me see here. Yeah, okay. See? Yeah. yeah, we can yeah. see it. All right. So Vladimir sent this, bro. And well, I'll just listen to it. I think the speaker's down here. Mm -hmm. Hold on. Let me. Yeah. You, you tell me what you think after this. Hold on. Can you hear it? With whom I spent so much time talking, and he actually saved my career on a lot of different stages. Uh, if Stitch wouldn't be in my corner, I would not make the record of 12 years being a champion. So um, that's, that's so great to see you both, and Stitch is the man. Mm. Could you guys that hear it? Yeah, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah, it, 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 it choked me up, man, because, you know, he could be dead any time. Mm. You know, he, he was in danger for him to have thought about that. But let me let me now give you some insights as to why he said those things, right? Yeah. So the, the first time I worked with, well, goes back to December the 12th, 19, I say 1991, Vitaly says 1992, when the Soviet Union first broke, all right? Well, we took a, a team of professional boxers and kickboxers to Kiev to fight the Ukrainians, right? And at that point, I had a kickboxer, Mark Longo, world champion kickboxer. So we went with some boxers that we all met in New York and went to Kiev uh, to fight these guys. <clears throat> well, the Klitschko's were already, they were young, but they were already big stars. There were big posters of them on, yeah. on the walls and all that. And so I got to see them, but I never met them. And, and uh, when they came to Las Vegas to train, I mentioned that opportunity that I was there. And the next day I brought the poster, everybody had signed it. And now, oh, yeah, we were, so that's how we started and communicating, right? So when Vladimir and Lennox Lewis were in the movie uh, Ocean's Eleven, yeah. right? Yeah, so I was the next, I was Vladimir's cut man in the movie. Yeah, yeah. And, I remember. And, uh, yeah, so it was, you know, it, it, it was great. You know, I got to meet everybody. But then later on when uh, Vladimir had lost his world title to Lehman Brewster, and yeah. he had come back, he was with Emmanuel Stewart. So I <clears throat> um, used to call to a radio show like this, and me and my friend are watching people walk into the MGM for a fight. And Emmanuel Stewart's walking by, he's commentating, or HBO, and his tuxedo, and he comes by and says, Stitch, he goes, I want to talk to you about Vladimir. So I talked to my partner. I said, wow, did you see what I saw? Well, the next day he called and says, Vladimir said he wanted the cut man that was in the movie with him to be his cut man for the fight. <laughs> that was me, right? So, no. yeah, so of course, you know. So when he fought DeVero Williams in my first fight with him, uh, he actually gets a bloody nose in the dressing room. He's warming up and Boom, he hits himself, and I'm outside the tent. I'm watching the fight. He says, hey, man, come here, man. You got to come work on Vladimir. So that was my first thing. But during the fight, all right, he's looking okay. He's not looking great. He had just lost his world title, and he has a tough fighter to barely win. So first three rounds, he won. Okay, okay. The fourth round, uh, he gets dropped with the uh, a quick flash. All right, so as you look at this, I work with numbers. 
I'm looking at the scores. It's three rounds to two, right? And and uh, in the fifth round, he gets a headbutt, unintentional headbutt, and it's that big bang we have. It just yeah. breaks it. And I've worked on those in the UFC many times. So at that point, I knew that it, those are extremely hard to stop because it's that big bang. So the blood's going to get in your eyes. But as he sat down, I whispered to him and Vitaly and Emmanuel Storch on the other side, he couldn't hear. I said, look, you're winning the fight. You got a back cut. I'm going to have the doctor stop the fight. Mm -hmm. So when the doctor comes, they said, well, what do you think? I go like this and I open it up. And they stopped the fight. It went to the scorecards and he ended up winning the fight. And then Soli later became world champion. So I got him to that level, right? Yeah. And and that's a story very few people know. Mm -hmm. So, but I'll tell you the end of it now. The end of it when he fought Anthony Joshua, Wembley okay. Stadium. You know, awesome fight. Him. Ah, tremendous. Just the energy that was was tremendous, right? Amazing. And I've been with Vladimir and Vitaly through all, all these their their fights. Vitaly, when he came from retirement, he started off with Danny Williams and, and he so grew I up with them here. Pardon me? We grew up with them here. They're Yeah, them. yeah. So you know, yeah, yeah. So uh so uh, Lambert's going to fight Anthony Joshua. So I didn't get there to London until Thursday night because my daughter Carla had gotten married in the island of Crete. So Thursday I flew to London and Vladimir was staying in an apartment. And, uh, but I didn't see him to the weigh-ins. So we're at the weigh-ins. I'm talking to him in Italy and Jonathan Banks and the team. But Vitaly and, and, and Vladimir we're going over how you feel, any problems, any issues. So I understand, you know, we go over the concepts. And, but at the end, I put my hand on Vladimir's shoulder. I said, look, don't worry about nothing tomorrow. I'm gonna take care of you like you're my son. And I leave because I know, remember we were talking about the mind. I know the night before these guys can't sleep. You know, mm -hmm. they're this and that. So here's where the barn burner comes, bro. So here I am in front of 90,000 people, all you guys around the world. Vladimir and I are this far apart. I'm putting the final Vaseline on him. And he says, you could call me son. Oh, oh damn. Bro. That's crazy. Like, it gives me chills even just telling you now. Yeah, I, I got chills. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm telling you. But I knew that I had gotten into his head on a positive side. See what I'm saying? Yeah. And so his his comfort zone was, was good. And it was one of the best fights he's ever had. Whether he won or whether he lost, it was like a Rocky movie, I told him, because the fans were, please go, please go, please go, Joshua, Joshua. Yeah, he was that kind of fight. And now Vladimir and Anthony Joshua are best of friends. Mm. So <clears throat> I, he calls me up. You know, we're back home now. Daddy, he said, Daddy. <laughs> uh, you know, we talk and all that. And, but months later, I didn't want to ask him, but months later, I saw him in Germany. And I said, Vladimir, that moment, why? So I said, that moment, why? He says, Stitch, there's very few people I trust in my life. You are one of them. Mm. Bro. That's amazing. That's something. That's something. Oh, it's, it's phenomenal. Vitaly, you know, when, when I, I'm saying goodbye to him uh, in the dressing room, and he puts his hand on my arm and on my shoulder, he says, Stitch, I love you. You've been <laughs> with us for all these years. You are always welcome to my house, you know, and... Uh, yeah, so these are the moments I've had with these guys, you know, and they're all special, special moments you just can't buy. Yeah. You know, so that's pretty awesome. Yeah. So, so there's more than just being a cat, man. It, it, it's just so more. It's your life. And the beautiful story you told us with Klitschko's and you, and it was crowned uh, with statues. Am I right? You got some uh, statues from Vitaly and Vladimir. Uh, how'd you know about that? <laughs> Did my research. Huh? Yeah. You know what, man? These guys, of all the people I work with, and I've worked with so many great, great fighters, so many great people, they've, they're not even a close second, man. They, everything that they've done, they've done first class, and, and they treat everybody with respect. And that's why, you know, I am, and just very, very humble people, but uh, they could fight. Yeah, so they, they made some statues. Here we go. I'm gonna show you, man. Look. Yeah. Right. No, that's awesome. nice. That's nice. That's nice. So the thing about it, they're they're about this this big. They're about two feet tall. They weigh about 35 pounds. I put it in my luggage because 
Well, what they did is they, to say goodbye, to say thank you, yeah. they flew us all to Austria, to their training center, beautiful hotel, snow, I mean, it's gorgeous, for the weekend, just to say thank you for being part of the team, and they presented us with these. And, uh, but it was so heavy, it, it broke my luggage. <laughs> but, you know, but I got it home. Yeah, yeah, that's good. You still have it? Yeah, of course, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's uh, I, I don't have no, there's no memorabilia on my walls. Yeah. The only thing that I have is the statue uh, in its own, it's its own place right now. All right, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, listen, uh, I have to ask this because I'm a, I'm a huge MMA fan, you know. Uh, obviously, you were in boxing longer because, I mean, uh, MMA just started 30 years ago or something like that. Uh, but uh, w what is the difference in, in working in MMA and uh, in boxing? Because, you know, d definitely the cuts in MMA are way different than in uh, boxing because a lot of more exterior damage happens uh, uh, in, the, in the MMA. So uh, is it a tougher job in that manner or is it uh, maybe easier? How do you perceive working in MMA uh, or in boxing, you know? Yeah, you know, and people ask me that. I, uh, yeah, for action, I, you got to go MMA. You know, for the yeah. type of cuts and the type of injuries, and you know, just the heart and soul of these fighters, it's, it's phenomenal. Uh, but fast forward into bare knuckle fights, uh, that takes over MMA. They're, yeah. they're not as deep, they're not as big, but but there's more of them, mm. and and uh, what they call short term damage, uh, opposed to long term damage. Uh, but boxing, yeah, boxing is a science. Uh, it, it's okay, but yeah, for for working, MMA is is exciting. Yeah, uh, and listen, there is a there is a popular meme in, in the MMA world. Uh, whenever some fighter does something that pisses off Dana White, uh, there is a meme that says uh, that uh, rephrases the quote he said about you. Uh, this guy, whoever he is was never my friend. <laughs> uh, were you friends, Stitch? <laughs> uh, based on his opinion, you know, that, that's pretty legendary meme in the MMA world. Really, you know, it, it's funny you say that because I, I did a show in Dallas and this former basketball player is now kind of like a commentator for Showtime. Yeah. So we take a picture together and, and he puts it out on, on Twitter that if you guys don't know who this guy is, so-and-so. So those remarks, were replied by people. I didn't know that they existed. The Stitch and I were never friends. And you know, <laughs> you know, so I, there was, I mean, there was like five messages and three of them had that, you know, oh yeah, we're back. We're back to the Stitch and I were never friends. Yet, right. And <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so it became a meme and, and God has been what, seven, eight years since the UFC let me go. And, and people all over the world still stop me and they associate me with the yeah. UFC. I was looking at, I was going through some channel surfing the other day, my wife and I, and we stopped at uh, UFC shows on ESPN. And jokingly, I, see, I tell my wife, huh, I wonder if they'll show me. Five seconds later, my name, Stitch, is on the, they got my back, you know. <laughs> you know so they, they can't get rid of me. But uh, yeah, so the love and support has been tremendous all, all over the world and all over the world. Had a, a one of the Royals in, in Dubai come and, and F Dana and this and that, and, <laughs> you know, of respect for you. And, yeah. and had a Brazilian, one of these Brazilian coaches. Tell you, we did the, the show Boxing in the Bubble, right? The yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Luis, I used to train Anderson Silva, so top trainer, uh, Doria. He comes up to me because it's everything's, we're on lockdown and we're having lunch. It's like prison, bro. So he has his train, he comes up to me, but he says, Stitch, of all the compliments I've got, this one was the best. He says, Stitch, he says, Stish, we, the coaches, the fighters, we thank you for speaking up because we couldn't. Mm. Oh, that's it all right there, man. Mm, yeah. yeah. And, yeah, so, yeah, so, I man, you got to speak up for what's right. Yeah, that's that's what I intended to tell you because now, not just from fight from fans, but from fighters, you got a lot of support, a lot of love because you did something honorable and you spoke for those who were silent, basically. Yeah. And now that smoke settled and everything, would you do it again? Do you regret it? Regret speaking up? Yeah. No, bro, I'm trying to get these guys unionized right now. Shit, I to work that <laughs> over, man. You know, I'm working, I'm working with some some people from you know big unions that that want to get involved. And you know, so no, I'm hey, this is a long run for me. You know, that was just the beginning. But 
you know, when, when that opportunity came, uh, because keep in mind, the fighters were making a lot of money on sponsors. Yeah, We were making coming. I was making money on sponsors. When they would come to me, I would sell my deal to them. Then I would include the other cut men. So they wouldn't get paid, but I got paid. But you had three or four sponsors and, you know, Leon Tats bought a Cadillac. You know, so, 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 you know, but we did. So when they took all that away, I, uh, it, it just wasn't fair. And, and being that when I go back to my life, when I grew up as a farm worker, my parents, Cesar Chavez was uh, our leader, our, the guy that fought for our rights at that time. Amazing. Uh, and, and so my parents were in that revolution that trying to, yeah, trying to unionize the farm workers. So when they, that, I got a call from, John Nash, never met him from Bloody Elbow. He calls and asks, would you be interested in doing an interview on how the Reebok deal affected the cut men? Mm. And I thought about my parents and all the people that were fighting for fair practices for farm workers. Listen, you know, there was no restroom for women out in the fields. My mom and sisters would have to go down the orchard, and go there and go to the restroom. And we all drank out of the same metal can, same tin can. That was it. They would spray uh, pesticides in the fields next to us and, you know, all that shit. So they always fought for the rights. So when the guy asked me if I'd be interested in doing an interview, I thought about my parents. And I said, if I didn't speak up, they wouldn't be proud of me. So I spoke very, if you read the interview, I've done tons of interviews. People say it's very, there was nothing that was said, except for maybe the fact that maybe I got to concentrate on boxing because it pays a little bit more than UFC, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what pissed Dana off, right? Yeah. But, but I had to do it. And <clears throat> so I'm getting tons, when tons and tons of messages when it comes out, the interview, right? F Dana, F Reebok, F UFC, and go, go. And I'm doing, I did like 57 interviews in a week. I had camera yeah, yeah. crews coming to my house. It was the biggest thing in MMA, right? And, and yeah. the thing about it, yeah. See, Dana, I knew Dana before the gyms, uh, before the UFC. Yeah. He was always he was always in the gyms. You know, he said he was in boxing, but in all fairness, I never saw him work a fight. You know, <laughs> he might have been in boxing as an amateur in, in Boston, but here he would do pads for the executives and their wives. And shit, he was making money, but he hooked up with the Fertitas. And the Fertitas are the ones that bought the UFC, and Dana was friends with them, and that's how he became president. But he brought me in and yeah. bless his heart for that. He's the one that changed my life. And and because at that time, it was only Leon Tabs, the original cut man from UFC number one. Yeah. The legend, the, the, the godfather of cut man. Yes. So they, they, uh, Dana brought me in. I, I was doing a K1 at the Bellagio. Uh, Bob Sapp fought chemo. <laughs> oh, that, 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 that's the weird times. Weird yeah, times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I tell you, I've done them all, bro. So Dana was in the audience, right? And he says, hey, man, give me a card, you know. And the uh, next day he calls and says, look, we got the UFC interested in being a cut man. And, of course, you know, I quit watching the original UFC because it was just too violent. There was yeah. no rules. and, and, ba and Barely and, rules. And yeah, yeah, barely, yeah. So, but Dana said that they had implemented all these additional rules. And I figured, yeah, let me join. So it was Leon Tams and myself and we and Burt Watson. Burt Watson, were, we were the three amigos. but. The program that Burt Watson put with handling the fighters behind the in the dressing rooms and all that, Burt created all of that. Walking them into the that the the, the work that we do as cut men, uh, Leon Tabs and myself created that. Not everybody Universal uses it because it yeah. works, you know. Yeah. So we're there to teach, and uh, so yeah. But man, I did tons of interviews, and <laughs> and then one of my friends calls me. My wife and I are at Costco, and and uh, and we're all friends, right? So Jesse calls me and says, hey, man, friend. you got time to talk, right? Yeah. Uh, you were never my friend either, bro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, Jesse calls and asks if I can talk. I said, no, nah, I'm at Costco. Call me in an hour. Well, two hours or an hour later, Jesse and Mark call my, my two friends. And, and the only thing that Mark says is, because of the interview you did about Reebok, the UFC is not going to use you no more. Mm -hmm. Bam. It's like a shot. Right here. Same, same chair. Same place that, uh, that wow. they fired me as I'm talking to you guys. So I'm going my messages. And the first one I see is I respond back to the guy. And I said, you know, just want to let you be the first to know. UFC just yeah. let me go. 
course, I remember the tweet. Yeah, yeah, I, I got to find a new job. That shit went viral. The interviews continued. And it was so bad that the guy from Reebok, my wife and I and my son are having breakfast and they we're in the kitchen and the phone rings and it's Mike, the guy from Reebok, and he's apologizing. Man, we had nothing to do with it. And, you know, and <laughs> it's all right. I understand. I know it had nothing to do with them, but it was about Reebok. It was about that program. And uh, she, when I did the first Creed, Wesley Snipe comes up to me, shakes my hand and says, hey, the UFC did you wrong. I said, wow. Even Hollywood knew about it. So I the whole world, yeah. So I'm I'm proud to do what I did and always fight for your rights. Yeah. yeah. You know, you're OG. You're OG. And Ooh. talking with you now, it feels like talking to to, to, to living encyclopedia of combat sports. You know? And not just combat sports. You mentioned the movie multiple times, Creed. And you're the big part of Rocky franchise. In first three, in Rocky Balboa as well, am I right? Yeah. Uh, can I ask you, is Sly Stallone your friend? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, but I'll tell you a story, man. Yeah, you know what? I, I tell people, how many guys you know have done three movies with Rocky? Mm. I have, <laughs> right? How many guys you know have done three movies with Michael B. Jordan? I have. To me, that's, that's, that's pretty heavy stuff, right? It's and, uh, all right, so there's a real famous actor, Mexican actor called Edward James Olmos. Uh, lives, uh, he's a famous, I met him in the, right here. I met him in the UFC, right? Yeah. I, I, knew he, I knew he was going to be there because he was going to do a movie with Anderson Silva. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> uh, so I'm in the dressing room wrapping a fighter's hands and one of the UFC staff says, hey, man, Edward James almost wants to meet you. I said, oh, shit. Man, I finished wrapping hands. I, I walked down the hall. I turned the corner, and I'm looking at him like I'm looking at you, and we start laughing. But we look so much alike, right? <laughs> so anyway, that's that, that's that story. So Sylvester Stallone going with, with a great, great guy, and I'm a super guy. So we're talking on break, and it's me and Sylvester Stallone and his friend Frank, and we're talking to the people that do the makeup. And just hanging out. So Frank is kind of bragging about me. Oh yeah, this is Stitch and best cut man in the world and this and that. And it looks like Andrew James almost. And like this, bro. So Mr. Stallone's like this with his arms folded. And he says, more like Andrew James almost. And he walks away. I said, oh man, that was a cold shot, bro. You know, yeah. there's nothing I could do. But now super, super guy, a lot of respect for him. And and I'll give you a little trivia. I could have no counterpunch with that, you know. But yeah, in the movie, my name was Marcel in the script. And I'm thinking, shit, I have to change that somehow. I, how, you know? But when it was time for Rocky to introduce us to Adonis, he says, oh yeah, this is Stitch. He's the best cup man in Philadelphia. <laughs> Bro, my heart's going like this, man. I said, yeah, you know, yeah. Who's going to say stop? No, nah, no, nah, his name's Marcel. But the next day, I, uh, I thanked him. And he says, no, nah. he goes, it has to be authentic. So he's the one that uh, did the yeah. greet. Yeah, in the first, in the Rocky movies, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but you were never uh, mentioned as a Stitch. Am I right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, I was. Now, let me tell you the story with this one. Mm. Is is they Joe Cortez had called me. Joe was a referee, right? Mm. Hey, man, you want to, you know, you got to do Balboa and so and so. You want to be in the movie? And I said, I can't. I said, I got a, a world title fight in Paris, France with Fabrice Diozzo. And then the next week, I'm going to be in London with Audley Harrison. So I'm thinking money, right? Uh, so I tell him no, and I call my wife at work, and I tell her that, and I said, well, I can't go. She goes, are you crazy? She says, Rocket's an American icon. You have to do it, you know? Wow. <laughs> so I thought about it. Yeah, I thought about it. Literally, I'm on the computer negotiating with the people in London, and I delete it, and I let them know that this opportunity came, and, and I hope you understand, and they did. And it turns out that the fights in Paris, in Paris France with the Ozo got canceled. So... I owe a lot to my wife, man. So yeah, yeah. So that's that's how things happen. A lot of man does. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, smart man. Yeah, you know. uh, and it seems because you missed also now with uh, Fury and uh, other fights, you missed a lot of fights because of this movie, because of Fury. Yeah. So yeah. it seems like you have some kind of special re relationship with that franchise, with the Creed franchise. Yeah, yeah, Rocky. Oh, hundred percent. You know. I, Ryan Coogler is the one that wrote and directed Creed. 
Great and, director. Yeah. We love great, it. Great director. He's directing Black Panther. Yeah. Uh, and it did the, the first and second one. So he's from Oakland, California, and that's where I was from. Right? Young guy. Him and Michael B. Jordan have always been like that. Yeah, but, they made, you know, I think all of his movies are with Michael. Yeah. Yes, awesome. yeah, 100% right. Yeah. yeah so, uh, so he was training with Andre Ward, I guess, in preparation, whatever. But Andre is the one that suggested me to work with him. So I came on board and I told Ryan Coogler then, I said, look, if I see something that's not right, I'm going to bring it up to your attention. He goes, Stitch, please, please do. We want you to, you know, because they want that authenticity. So I always had a good relationship with him. So I'm doing the second one and every day I'm wrapping Michael's hands and uh, just him and I. And, you know, and and I, I tell him how proud I am of him, him and Tessa and Ryan Coogler and Steve Kappel, the director. And I'm wrapping his hands. He looks at me and says, Stitch, he goes, I'm directing Creed 3. No, he says, we went from being actors to writers, producers, directors. And he says, I'm directing Creed 3. And you're with me as long as you want. I said, man, talk about being part of history. Yeah, you especially. Know? Yeah. And for me, it's not about the money. It's not about, it's about just saying that I did it. Because I, I never forget where I come from. I'm always that little humble Mexican kid that grew up as a farm worker, where if I could do it, anybody could do it. I ain't no different than anybody. It's just that these opportunities have come, and I'm not scared to take advantage of them. You know, so I've been blessed. Yeah, uh, but as you mentioned that, uh, I was thinking, like you said, you were a kid from Mexico and uh, you came up and did uh, did it all, so anybody can do it. Uh, but uh, I was thinking about something that uh, uh, I, I don't remember which uh, who who this quote was, but he said, "Boxing is a uh, is a poor man's sport, essentially." Uh, do you think that, that, that that's something that you made connection there with the, the boxing, that kind of boxing accepts everyone? Is that the feeling you got, that boxing kind of accepts everyone and there anybody can make it, you know, if they got the guts? No, no never, good question, though. I've never looked at it that way. It's, uh, but, but you're absolutely right. You know, majority, years ago, I put a documentary together called Boxers Night. And it never went nowhere, but it was because I went to the wrong people. It was a, but I got good information on that. But a majority of these fighters that fight have less than a high school diploma, right? So economically, a majority of these fighters that fight, when it comes to the poverty level, they make less per year than what the poverty level. There's no money in boxing until you get to a certain point. Yeah. And the sacrifices that you get to get from point A to point B to C and D, it's it's long and it's hard and you know it takes dedication. I'm in these gyms every day you know, all the time and I look. Every one of those guys that's hitting the bag and jumping rope and sparring, they all have that dream to be that whole chat about money. But they say 1% of the fighters make 99% of the money. So it's a hard sport, but you got to do it for, for the love of it. And I, and I tell people what we do, what you guys do, if you do it for the money, you do it for the wrong reason. You got to have a passion for what you do, you know, and uh, that's the way these guys are. But whether I'm working a four rounder or a 12 rounder, I'm going to treat you the same. I don't even charge the four rounders. You know, yeah. six rounders. I don't need to charge them because I tell them, I said, look, I want you to understand the importance of having a good team, a good corner, and to understand the proper way of doing it. That's why I do it. I always get back. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you, who, who is your favorite to work with? And it's obviously Klitschko. <laughs> so there's no point asking that. But this is a little bit nasty question, but is there somebody you wouldn't wish to work with again? Or No, that's a good question. No, you know what? It's, um, you know, Keep in mind, I, I come in for one thing and one thing, I'll have to take care of you, right? And and whether you win or whether you lose, I'm going to give you 150% of what I have. And they understand that, you know? And, uh, but no, you know, the guys, uh, no, you know, now there's guys early on in my career that if they were to pay me what they owe me now, I'd be driving a brand new Porsche, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but but those are those days, right? And so it, it's happened, you know, but, but for personality changes, nah. They're they're all good people, man. Somehow, mm -hmm. you know, you like say you guys are you know the Eastern Bloc country. I work with a lot of fighters from the ex old Soviet Union era, yeah. and and their personality. Your personalities are different. My personality is different than yours. So it takes a special uh, relationship for you to accept me. And many of them have. They all have. You know, they understand. Even if I don't know you, like <laughs> I was doing the fights uh, like Bellator, a lot of the uh, Dagestan fighters. 
you know, Habib and them, shit, they all want me to wrap their hands. And I don't even know, but they know my legacy, right? Yeah. So when I see the list of, of five Dagestan fighters, I'm thinking, oh, shit, I have to wrap five fighters. I can't all undefeated. Them. <laughs> Probably, yeah, 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 but but you know, once again, I have that respect factor from them, and that's that's what makes it all worthwhile. Mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, listen, from your position as a as a cut man, you know, I I love these conversations, even even if they can get a little messy sometimes. But who do you think uh, who do you think is a goat in boxing? You know, do you have or do you have Mount Rushmore of boxing? You know, uh, something like that. That someone you, that you exceptionally watch or, or like to watch? Nah, you know, no, yeah. like, uh, no, like like Gervonta Davis and, and Roland Romero. Uh, it's pay per view, right? Nah, I don't watch pay per views. <laughs> nah, <I just> don't, <laughs> you know, for me, I I, uh, I understand. You give me the who won, who who lost. Uh, but nah, you know, I don't. There's no top ten, top five. You know, I, I work with so many guys that I said I like you better than I like Peter. You know, I can't do that. You know. It's not but, my nature. Then, then try, try to pick between these go these guys in a fight. Ali versus Tyson. Uh it'd be Ali in a heartbeat. Oh, you know, yeah. whenever you know, when, whenever you have a a, a flat footed fighter mm -hmm. with somebody that moves around, Mayweather or Muhammad Ali, the uh, Tony, I work on numbers, right? The yeah. probability of this guy winning is higher than this guy catching you. You're swinging. If you're busy swinging one time and trying to hit it with a home run, like Roly. Roly's trying to go for that home run, and the and the odds caught up to him. So yeah, I'm yeah. Uh, What did you think of Canelo's latest, you know, against uh, Dmitry Bivol? Uh, what did you think? Well, that, that was an, that was another thing. Uh, <clears throat> I don't think he had a plan B and a plan C. Yeah, and, you know, sometimes the <clears throat> the confidence level it gets so high that you kind of maybe not so much him but his people feed into he's um you know he's it's really leader. hard to be humble when you're stopping the jungle something like yeah, that yeah, no, no i understand 100 percent. you know and and you know it's the thing it's like the achilles you know they found that weakness in him that weakness was the maybe the overconfidence and and bivo but i listen i told my wife the first round as a canelo can't get close to Bibble. Bibble's, he kept him at bay, he changed the angles, and he made it difficult, a flat-footed fighter against somebody that moved around. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? And uh, on the 18th, I'm working with uh, Joe Smith. Uh, he's fighting uh, Better Beat him. Yeah. And Better Beat him is a tough, tough kid too. You know, so these Russians, I always said it, man. I said in MMA and, and, and uh, in boxing, Russians are taking over. The Russians are what the Mexicans were. You know, we're the dominant ones, right? You know, yeah. that's shit, man. The, the the Russians are coming in heavy. Yeah, know? yeah. They're learning the professional style of boxing. Same with the Cubans. Cubans learn from being amateurs now, because that's why a lot of them come to Vegas, because they learn the uh, Mexican style or, or just the boxing. Uh, that's how they would score it and how they would fight in the United States. Yeah. But then they're putting the the heart and soul of, of your bloodline. You know, that's what makes you guys so tough. Yeah. You know? But you and have you Chavez. Tough. So huh? you have Chavez. Uh, so it's legacy forever. Next yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, I saw Chavez at the fights uh, December the other, on the night in Dallas. And I said, you know what? I, I want to let you know that the first world title fight I ever worked was I worked with Tony the Tiger Lopez against you in Monterey, Mexico. And yeah, for real. That. Yeah, yeah. My first world title fight, not the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. <laughs> so yeah. but he was my first in boxing. Mm, yeah. And have it ever happened to you, maybe running across the gym or somewhere or, or just watching the match and you see some young man, some kid, and you said, this kid got it, you know, it will, uh, he will be great. Did it ever yeah, happen? You could, yeah, you, yeah, you could, you could, you could see it and, you know, you see natural skills. Opposed mm -hmm. to being taught, and and uh, yeah, there's there's a couple of young guys in the gym actually. One guy's like 13 years old. He just he's like a Javante Davis type of fighter. Like I look at him, I see Javante Davis, right? But he's 13 years old, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's another kid that just has good boxing skills that you know he's just going to grow from there. So yeah, you could see it. There was one kid, uh, a young man. He was I guess in early 20s, 
Well, I walk into the gym, I said, man, you look like an athlete. And he's a good fighter, but he's not disciplined. And that's the factor that's not going to make him a good fighter. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And he didn't want to learn. It's one of the guys I try to teach him how, you know, it's all right. I'm, yeah. I'm that's it. Yeah. But it means something coming from you. Even when you, you told PSI you are a fighter, it means something coming from the expert like you. And But apart from the, 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 the combat sports, uh, I saw a video, you, you drove a Ferrari. How does it feel to, <laughs> to drive a Ferrari? Oh, to draw, you saw that, huh? Yeah, yeah it was, uh, that was at the racetrack, right? Yeah. 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 yeah, so what happened is sometimes it's nice to be recognized, right? This guy he's from England, but he managed the racetrack here in Las Vegas, and he asked if I'd be interested in coming down as his guest. And, and yeah, sure, how about my son? Yeah, bring my son down. I was somewhat of an experience, man, just to run it. And I couldn't go as fast as my son. I was not as crazy, you know, uh, but that was a good experience. <laughs> you did do your homework, bro, because uh, nobody's ever brought that up to me before, but it was a great, great, great experience. Yeah, we want to know what's like to drive a Ferrari, you know, that, that, that's the thing. <laughs> we yeah, well, it, it was, well, this had numbers and all that shit on it, so it's not my own personal one, so I couldn't really get in this on a track like this, so, uh, but... Yeah, just to get in, it was uh, it was pretty awesome. And then uh, he he actually has like ten diecast just behind me of Ferrari. <laughs> yeah, I I have He's a little, obsessed with it. Yeah, I have toys like little models that, that that I collect. You know, hopefully one day they will be bigger. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. If, you, if you mount them all together, you might make it a little bigger. <laughs> no, no, <not> that. <laughs> <laughs> now you shut me down, like slided. Uh, <laughs> yeah, hey. Yeah, yeah, like like Stallone, right? Yeah, yeah, but it's cool. Stage, honestly, I, I could talk for for days, but uh, we run up with time. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. thank you for this opportunity. I, I at the moment I I was just geeking out. So I couldn't form a sentence even, you know. And uh, looking on the screen, I, and I am just like. <laughs> I'm out. Those are some good stories, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll tell you one more. You you were talking about OG, right? Yeah. yeah. So I, I did the, I think that's when Mike Tyson fought Roy Jones. I did one of the, the shows, and uh, uh, Snoop Dogg is there. And he yeah. walks in the ring and, oh, Stitch, man, you're a legend, and all that stuff. And we, we hug each other, and we're going down the stairs because uh, he has a program called. Uh, Guns down, gloves up. So they had a guy from the Crips uh, spar with a guy from the Bloods, and they're rappers, right? So anyway, we're walking down the stairs, and he says, "Oh, gee, can I take a picture with you?" Yeah. <laughs> He's asking me, right? I said, "Wow, well, yeah." So I appreciate it, man. And good, yeah. good, thanks for having me on. And you know, let's do it again. Yeah, for sure. For You're sure. always welcome. Yeah, always. Open doors for you. All right, you guys. Good luck on your show, huh? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Steve.